told your friends goodbye, then you threw away. You said you had to leave to go prepare a place. So the way you are, we may also be. Now there's a world full of doubters, but I believe this could be the day we meet you in the sky. Hour. We will be like you in the twinkling of an eye, caught up by your power. For the sun, it's going down on the day of grace. Oh, in any moment now, we could see your face. I know it's not your will that any be left. Jesus, help me change some parts in life. Cause they run unbelief like the spear shoves through your side. The Lord, it cuts so deep that it makes me wanna cry. Cause this could be the day we meet you in the sky. This could be the hour. We will be like you in the twinkling of an eye, caught up by your Down on the day of grace Oh, in any moment now We could see your face You taught us to be looking for The end of the age And your hand through history Has been turning every day Now this could be the day you in the sky, this could be the hour. We will be like you in the twinkling of an eye, ordered by your power. This could be the day we meet you in the sky, this could be the hour. We will be like you in the twinkling of an eye, ordered by your power. Oh, the sun, it's going down on the day. Sun, it's going down on the day of grace. Oh, the sun, it's going down on the day of grace. At any moment now, we could see your face. LHB family and anybody else that's out there watching, I bet you were surprised by that intro uh, with the intro to the Oprah Winfrey show. Well, you know, I, I was taken or I was given the task of, of having a topic for this conference on the intrusion or infiltration of the church by different heresies, by New Age doctrine, etc. And what became difficult is that there is so much infiltration that it's no longer that. It's a, the floodgates have been open, and what's happening now is that there's so much open that the church, and I say church with uh, the air quotes up, the church is now exporting New Age philosophy and meology into the world. The church has become not the place where the gospel of Jesus Christ is paramount, 
but the gospel of loving yourself and God will provide all of your wants and desires if you just follow certain principles. So that's why we had, that's why I had uh, Oprah Winfrey, uh, that theme as, as the start. So what I hope to do in this video is to take what appears to be a hodgepodge of, of things going on and we'll see how they actually come together in, into one thing, and that's the unification of mankind and getting rid of the gospel of Christ. So please, please go along with me on this trip, and uh, it'll be sad at the end when you see the tragic results of one certain leaders. So here we go, here's a, a clip now of, of an introduction to a new age practice called a course in miracles. And also by, uh, by the way, uh, fellow LHB uh, co-laborer, uh, Addie Miller has an excellent 30 minute, 30 minute overview of A Course in Miracles that I recommend you watch. And you can see the, the religious underpinnings of A Course in Miracles. Now, what is A Course in Miracles? It was, it was a, uh, it was Helen Shuckman was a, a woman in Columbia University and, and she had gotten revelation from this spirit that had her do an automatic handwriting. And this spirit's name is Jesus. What does scripture tell us to do? Uh, Jesus himself said many false Christs will come. This is in Matthew chapter number, number 24. And, and also, we're told to test every spirit. To test every spirit. You know, these are important things that the scripture tells us to do. So here it is, A Course in Miracles. I first saw A Course in Miracles on someone's coffee table, and I suppose 1977, something like that. And I read the introduction. And the introduction is a kind of astonishing thing. I have it here. The introduction says, this is A Course in Miracles. It is a required course. Only the time you take it is voluntary. Free will does not mean that you can establish the curriculum. It means only that you can elect what you want to take at a given time. The Course does not aim at teaching the meaning of love, for that is beyond what can be taught. It does aim, however, at removing the blocks to the awareness of love's presence, which is your natural inheritance. The opposite of love is fear, but what is all-encompassing can have no opposite. This Course can therefore be summed up very simply in this way. Nothing real can be threatened. Nothing unreal exists. Herein lies the peace of God. I saw that. I read it. And I thought that was the most amazing piece of writing. Um, to pick up a book and have the book tell you it's a required course. I mean, you go, well, who wrote it? What is it? Who is telling me that this book is a required course? I was so intrigued by that. I read one page. And in that one page of reading it, I heard for the first time in a little inner voice that said, Physician, heal thyself. This is your way home. And I had the most amazing experience of, of feeling a sense of oneness with the whole world, that there was absolutely no separation, that there was only love, and a real feeling that I was to be of service to God. My whole life would be changed, and it would be a life of giving and, and, and a life of being of service. I really couldn't understand that, but it was a very deep, uh, penetrating uh, feeling. And I became a student of the Course, fought it all the way, couldn't deal with the thickness of the Course, let alone its Christian terminology. And yet there was something about the Course that just compelled me to go on. 
The spiritual genesis of the international bestseller, A Course in Miracles, is both extraordinary and inspiring. The self-study three-book course was dictated by an inner voice, and it has profoundly changed the lives of countless people the world over. Spread mainly by word of mouth, its principles have thus far been known only to its students. But now, its transformational teachings of love, forgiveness, inner peace, and wisdom will be explored. Communicating the correct meaning of the course rests largely with Dr. Kenneth Wapnick, president of the Foundation for A Course in Miracles. In a recent television interview, he gave an enlightening overview of the course. It's a form of spiritual psychotherapy uh, that, that comes to us in a Christian context. As you mentioned at the beginning, uh, its author is Jesus. Uh, but it's a Christianity that has practically nothing to do with the, the traditional uh, teachings of 2,000 years. It certainly has, uh, has nothing to do with the Jesus of the Bible. Uh, its, principal, its principal message is uh, forgiveness and that the way that we remember our identity as God's children and realize that, that in his eyes we are all one is to forgive each other. Uh, it basically is a self-study course in the sense that, that you don't need anyone outside. Uh, the teacher or the guru, as it were, would be Jesus or the Holy Spirit, uh, who guides us day by day. Uh, our lives in this world are seen as a classroom, uh, basically, in which we learn uh, the Holy Spirit's lessons of forgiveness. And again, as I mentioned, it's by, by undoing all of the, uh, our feelings of inadequacy, our feelings of guilt, our anxieties, uh, which is what, what forgiveness brings about, that the love of God which is present in all of us is allowed to be remembered. There is a massive effort going on in this society, and I, I think throughout the world, to retrieve some lost part of ourselves. And A Course in Miracles is part of that effort. Okay, there you have it. You heard you heard the director, the then director of A Course in Miracles say that this is a course that was given by Jesus. And did you hear that? He actually said, this is not the Jesus of the Bible. <laughs> Amen? You have to pay close attention to that. There are many Jesuses. The New Age Jesus is a Jesus that's uh, a cosmic Christ that seeks to put everything together, bring everything through community, that all the world will be as one. Everybody in the world, every tree, every bird, every rock, everything will be singing kumbaya, and then we'll have world peace. So that, that's the point of it. And if we notice Marianne Williamson, she ran for president last year, and, and then won Gerald Jampolsky, who I want to look at, now, here's another clip of him receiving the 2005 uh, prize of, of excellence. Notice it's Pfizer Vaccines is one of the sponsors of this. And this is a medical prize for his work with the Center for Attitudinal Healing, which he and his wife founded in 1974. This was after he had gone through the Course in Miracles, where he was an atheist before, and now he is a follower of a false Jesus. Let's look at this. Let's look at what his, his attitude is toward uh, working with children. Each year, the Pride in Profession Awards inspire us by recognizing leaders in the medical profession who've achieved greatness in their own unique way. Their stories share common themes, integrity, commitment to service, community involvement. But what binds them together above all else is a compassion for others, the highest hallmark of being a physician. Their stories remind us how important it is to go above and beyond for our patients and to remember that each act of selflessness strengthens the medical profession for everyone. If I have one pebble of wisdom in this 80-year-young uh, old body that you're looking at, it would be the following. 
But I really don't know what's best for another person. I'd like to share just a few things about how the center started. And uh, we started we, dealing with children and adults with catastrophic illness because insurance policies uh, don't even pay for a, for a lot of things. And so it's very difficult. And it's a psychological support group for these people. Uh, physicians thought only physicians should deal with this kind of work. And I had the vision that it's possible to train lay people to be facilitators, uh, which would make it cost effective to help people find a way of helping each other, uh, changing their attitudes, choosing to have peace instead of conflict, choosing to be a love finder rather than a fault finder. I became curious about where do kids go, and I found out that the way they go is to the cleaning lady who's mopping up the floor in the morning to to have a, an honest, uh, direct uh, conversation. And a seven-year-old boy asked the oncologist, this boy had cancer, what's it like to die? And uh, the oncologist got fearful and changed the subject. When we began to start this center, it became very clear that uh, these children were going to be like uh, young children, but wise spiritual wisdom, teaching me and other people another way of looking at death and another way of looking at, at dying. And uh, I began to see that, uh, uh, that here I was in a position of killing myself with alcohol, and yet I was fearful to die. And uh, these young children, if you will, became my teacher of looking at life in a different way, looking at death in a different way. I think we physicians get caught in a workaholism, which we're getting uh, cookie points for, but oftentimes that workaholism keeps us from looking inside to see what's going on in our heart. I think it's very important to follow your heart. And if your heart really tells you this is your way, then this is what I would go for. I tell people that uh, I, I wouldn't advise anyone to come a doctor. I think they have to make that decision on their own. I find that working to stay in the present is very important to let go of the past and the future. I happen to think that, uh, that forgiveness, uh, although it hasn't been taught in medical schools for a long time, uh, until recently, uh, is one of the main functions uh, that a doctor has. I think the most important suggestion I might make uh, for people to make up their own minds about would be to make love and forgiveness the most important thing they do as, as a physician, to resist the temptation to, to make judgments on their patients and to, to realize that many of our illnesses today, many particular stress illnesses that are caused by stress, are caused by negative judgments, our unforgiving thoughts. And so healing ourselves as well as the patient is really important. In fact, at our center, we don't even call people patients, we call them co-workers because we see them as equals. And I would suggest to young people that uh, being a physician is a way of healing themselves because by, by, you can't really help other people in a total way unless you're really accepting that love yourself and believing in something that's greater than yourself, a higher power, a loving source. Okay. Now, here's another clip of Gerald Jampolsky and his wife, Diane, talking about their great work that they do with children to give them hope. And notice this hope is not a biblical hope whatsoever. It's a hope in the cosmos. It's a hope that all of humanity will be, will be together as one. And it's all about the mind. So here that is. Hi, I'm Diane Serencioni. I'm Jerry Jampolsky. Uh, we've been doing uh, daily spiritual lessons with Carlos for almost three years now. And uh, uh, today uh, there was a lesson uh, around taking another look at how we look at death. Death being one of the biggest fears that we have. We, we, we think these bodies are what are real and that when they die, uh, that's the end of life. But uh, so many of us are seeing that differently now and feel that life is really eternal. And the essence of our life, our essence of who we really are, is, is love. And uh, children are wonderful teachers about these things. I remember a child named Greg Harrison, and we were quoting from a book, uh, Teach Only Love, actually. And uh, uh, there was no more chemotherapy going to be used for, for, for Greg, and, and everyone knew it that, that came to the meeting. I was the facilitator that night. 
And one of the kids who was 11, asked Greg, who was 11, what's it like to know that you're going to die in, in another two weeks because they're not going to be doing any more chemotherapy? Well, I was trying to think what I could say. Greg started to talk with great calmness. He said, oh, I think that when you die, you simply discard your body, which is never real in the first place. And then you go to heaven, you become one with all souls. And sometimes you come back and act as a guardian angel to someone. Well, that was an amazing statement out of an 11-year-old. And it sure got to me and the other kids in, the, in, in that room that day. And there's no question in my mind that uh, Greg is a guardian angel to me. So I really feel that there's a, that you don't need bodies to communicate. You, uh, that the minds really communicate and children are great teachers of spiritual truth. Okay. Another clip. This one is the Reverend Robert Schuler. Okay, he started the Crystal Cathedral in Orange, California, first in a drive-in theater there in Orange, and then he then then it went into a church building, but he still had people that would drive in and watch services from the parking lot. This next clip is from the very first television broadcast of the Hour of Power from 1970. And now I want to show this blasphemy that takes place. See if you could pick it out. I don't think I have to, uh, I don't think I have to even point it out because it is so direct and so obvious. And this goes right in line with Gerald Jampolsky and, and his beliefs. And uh, another thing to add on as well is that Gerald Jampolsky was on the Oprah Winfrey show on Good Morning America. He made his rounds for his groundbreaking work with children and, and the, the psychotherapy that he taught, which came from this New Age Jesus and, of course, in miracles. So here goes that clip. And uh, please, when you hear anything wrong, please raise your hand, let me know. And then, then we'll be back right after that. Good morning. Good morning. And a wonderful welcome to you who are worshiping in the drive-in congregation this morning. We had a little affair going here a few months ago, and I said good morning to the walk-in congregation, and then turned to you, everybody tooted their horn. That was a little too much, so don't toot your horn, but just smile at me through the windshield. And to everybody who's worshiping out there in the television congregation this morning, you are lucky people, because we have good news for you. We have good news for everybody. I want to share with you this morning the greatest news that I think I can share with people, and that is life can be different. Life can be better. Life can be wonderful. A prominent weekly uh, American news magazine came out with their predictions of what the 70s were going to hold, and they said in their summary article, the missing ingredient in the American culture today is joy. Well, we have joy producing news for you. The news is that you can become the kind of person you've always wanted to be. We've been thinking about this for about three weeks, and I want to say to you that there are, of course, three basic attitudes afloat in the world today by prominent thinkers. First, there is the attitude of Sigmund Freud who said basically human nature cannot be changed. You can't change human nature. Uh, you adjust people to situations, but you don't change them. And uh, then, of course, there's a concept of Karl Marx who says human nature can be changed. You simply change the environment. Now, we hear a lot about changing environment, and believe me, we have to do everything we can to clean up our environment from all of its pollution. But what I want to say to you this morning is 
while we clean up natural environments so we breathe clean air and we drink pure water, let's not forget to clean up, first of all, the environment within. I just came back this week from a lecture tour in the Midwest and I spoke to a large group of ministers of all faiths gathered in, a, in an assembly hall. There were the Catholic priests, the Protestant clergy, and the Jewish rabbi, and non-Protestant church leaders. Well, I haven't been in a situation like that in a long time. There was just a blanket of gloom that seemed to hover over all these people. All the world's problems were weighing them down. Their faces seemed to droop because their minds were drooping. I came back convinced more than ever that the biggest environmental problem in America is the environment in a man's head. We have a major problem of mental pollution of negative thinking. Now, you can change yourself, but you're not going to change yourself essentially by the environment without. Karl Marx is not correct. He made a colossal blunder when he said, if you simply change the economic environment, everything's going to come up roses. It just doesn't work that way. Wealth does not necessarily bring happiness. Poverty does not bring necessarily misery. Believe me, I know. I think I was 15 years old before my parents had enough money to buy me a Christmas present. I know what it's like to live and grow in childhood, only wearing cast-off clothes, never having a brand new pair of shoes for myself, living in a home without running water, without electricity until I was a teenager, and I'm only 43 years old. But we had a wonderful life. We did. Because there was an enormous faith in God and we loved each other and we were a happy family and we all pulled together and we prayed together and we believed together. Well, the economic environment in, the, uh, in that poor Iowa farm family where I was raised, the economic environment was not, not good, I suppose. But I'll tell you, the spiritual environment was fantastic. And through it all, we grew up with the determined belief that with God, all things are possible. And they are. The most important thing is what kind of a mental environment do you have? Change your mental environment and you change everything. If Freud said you can't change human nature, Marx made the mistake of saying simply change the environment and you change everything. We come now to Jesus Christ, who said simply this, change your mental environment. From doubt to faith, from negativity to positivity, from sin and guilt to living the God-like life following in Jesus Christ. Live that kind of a life, think that way, and everything changes. I've been recalling this week, because I've been planning my messages for the rest of this year, this is our 15th anniversary year as a church. And my mind went back this week to an experience about 12 years ago when we were still in the Orange Drive-In Theater. And we preached from the sticky tar paper roof of the snack bar for want of a place. We had no members, we had no money, we had no following. And then out of the clear blue, I decided to write to Dr. Norman Vincent Peale and ask him if he would come and preach in the church. I didn't describe the details of the sanctuary, but I said, Dr. Peale, I can assure you, it's a, it'll be a fantastic and unforgettable experience. And believe me, it's not a small place, it has parking for 1,700 cars. And the billboard out in front is by a major freeway and we can announce your sermon in great titles. 
Well, he accepted the invitation. And he stood with me and on that platform, and it was a hot, sun-baking day. And he looked across the great sea of automobiles that packed the Orange Drive-In Theater, and he looked with moist eyes as he began his sermon, and he said, you know, as I look across this vast congregation today, I asked myself, what would Jesus say to you if he had a chance to preach the sermon this morning? He paused, and he said, would he tell you what miserable sinners you are? No, I don't think so. Dr. Peel went on and said, the truth is, deep down in our heart, we all know it. And we kick ourselves around in guilt. But what Christ will say to you and would say to you this morning is, what a great person you can become if you will fill your mind with his spirit. You are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. You are the hope of the next generation. This is very simply what we say to you. Jesus Christ can come into your life, pack you with faith, and make you the kind of person you want to be. Okay. Now, did you see what was wrong with that? You see there's no gospel, no forgiveness of sin. It's all about changing your mental attitude. This is the gospel? This is, this is absolute heresy. The reality is that Jesus Christ came to save sinners. Yes, everybody in the world is a sinner and needs the forgiveness of God. Not just the forgiveness that Marion Williamson uh, and, and uh, Gerald Jampolsky and, and those New Age teachings have of forgiving yourself and letting go of those things. It's a forgiveness of sin which gives real freedom from that sin and a ticket to heaven to be with the Lord. I want to go have one more clip for you. And again, this is Gerald Jampolsky and his wife, Diane, talking about the afterlife. This is, this is what saddens me so much, a Christless eternity, not knowing where you're going to go when you die. It's important. Let me go to scripture for a second. I just want to read a little bit of Romans chapter number three, where I'm going to start. I don't know exactly, because the entire chapter along with chapter four is just so wonderful. Romans chapter three, let's go to verse 23. For all have sinned. How many is that? Is that just some people? Is it just a few people? No, it's for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. See, in order to go to heaven, in order to have an afterlife with God, one needs to have the glory of God. One needs to be as perfect as God is. How did that happen? Jesus went to the cross, took upon himself human flesh, suffered, bled, and died at the cross of Calvary. He took your sin, yes, your sin. He took my sin, yes, my sin. He took the sins of the world upon himself, and he died for that sin. He took your sin to that cross. And you know what, what came in its place? His righteousness. His glory is given in exchange for that. What a hope that is. 
Verse 24 says, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom, whom is Jesus, whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation. That was a tough word right there. Propitiation, the full satisfaction of God. God's demand for justice set forth to be a, a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. All sin, past, present, and future, have been forgiven, been remitted by God to declare I say at this time his righteousness that he, that he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. Amen. Now to that last clip and I want to give you one last bit of information on Gerald Jampolsky. Well, it is sad as a believer to hear that hopeless hope that they have. And you know, I was just looking at, at this at the at the list of, of books of of Dr. Gerald Jampolsky. Let me see if I can find them here. I, I had them. He had many books. Some of them will sound like they're, they're Christian books. The Little Book of Letting Go. Well, that wasn't him, but it's, that's somebody else. But Letting Go, Letting Go of all those things. Let it go, let it go. It wasn't that a song before? Uh, Back to Jampolsky, a mini course for life. Look at this one. Change your mind, change your life. It sounds exactly what the gospel was, according to Robert Schuller. I believe you'll find many Christian authors with the same type of title in their book. I think Joyce Meyer. Change your mind, change your life. It's all about your thinking. There's truth to that. Because if you're all, all a negative person, things are going to be negative for you. But our positivity isn't just the fact of changing our minds. Our positivity is that we've been changed or transformed completely by God. A couple more here, and then I'll move on. Love is letting go of fear. That's one of his top sellers right there, letting go of fear. I don't know exactly what fear they're talking about. Fear of death, just have to let it go. Not dealing with it, not dealing with it, the sin that you have. Love is the answer, creating positive relationships. That's something Joel Osteen would write. Out of darkness, into the light, a journey of inner healing. Yes, here's what that, that journey is like. Just closing your eyes and tuning out your mind and, and just saying a mantra. Oh, the peace and light are coming and the love is coming. I can feel the love flowing through me. It's New Age. Bravo, Sierra. That's exactly what it is. That's enough with Gerald Jampolsky's books. I end this on, on a, actually a, a sad note. Gerald Jampolsky died just this past December 29th, 2020. Gerald Jampolsky, though he was credited with helping many little children 
many families coping with pain and suffering, he died. And I know for sure he went to a Christless eternity. How can I know that for sure? Because he didn't trust Jesus Christ. In an article from the, the Marin Independent News or a Marin Independent Journal in Marin County, California, where John Polsky was from, listen to this quote by, by what his wife said. He says, we dedicated our lives to service, she said, to listening and meditating and not charging people we were invited everywhere we went. We never had a five-year plan and worked in 61 uh, countries. Chrissione, that's her maiden name, which she still went by, said that weeks before his death, Dr. Jampolsky had a vision that these children who learn to cope with their own mortality by listening to each other's trauma and fears also helped him accept death. The children would be there to meet him. It was a giant spiral of light above him and steps, she said. Each of the children reached down and brought him into the afterlife. I promised to hold that vision, and I did. I was with him, and I held his hand. I don't even know how to end this. But he meditated, practiced the New Age Jesus, and bases the afterlife of a vision of children leading him up a staircase. I'm just going to leave it there. Like I said, it started out being something that was that was about the infiltration into the church by these different things. But it's gone far more than in the church. Dr. Jampolsky had uh, an influence on many where these practices have been brought into modern medicine. Popular Christian authors partner with these same people like Rick Warren and Dr. Oz. And it's sad that our churches have turned into basically new age life centers where we can use the community to overcome the things that happen to us in this world. It's sad. But this is a reality, a reality that we face every day. If you're watching this and you haven't trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior, I beg you to do so. You can have all the wonderful mystical experiences you want but not having the true forgiveness of sins. You too, though meaning well, will enter into a Christless eternity. You know, it's, it's sad. Paul, the gospel that Paul spoke of in 1 Corinthians 15 is this, for I delivered that which was given unto me how that Jesus Christ died according to the scriptures. He was buried according to the scriptures. And he rose again according to the scriptures. This is our hope, 
Christian, if you're leaning on anything else except for the Word of God, for your source of, of information, nothing wrong with books, What? nothing wrong with watching this, these videos, but if you're relying on anything else, especially experience as your source of truth, you need to turn back to the Bible, read the Bible, study the Bible. This is the only way we're, where we're told where we can grow in. It's through studying the scriptures. Amen. Well, again, I didn't know exactly how this was going to go. But I, I hope that you've seen enough information here. And you'll see some of the things that... that are happening in the world and in the church and you'll you'll take note and trust the real Jesus that has been shown in the scriptures alone. Amen. Maranatha.